If I run to my left, I run into the other World Trade Center's collapse. I run that way, I die. I run that way, I die. I run this way. Okay? And I'm running. And I'm running hard. And I'm just running. I don't know what I'm running from. And I look over my shoulder, and there's a tornado chasing me. That big, you've seen that big black cloud just rolling. So that big black cloud is just running after me. So I'm running, I'm running. There's a, I'm in New York on a sunny Tuesday and I'm running my ass off from a tornado. And I have no idea what's going on. All of a sudden I was just, you know, jumped into some horror movie. So I dive under a car and I mean dive, like full out dive under a car, hold my head and this black tornado goes, Whoosh over me. And then it's black. And it's silent. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green, and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son, Troy, each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Howard Lutnick escaped certain death from the terrorist attack on the World Trade Center on September 11th because he was dropping his four-year-old son off at kindergarten. You may have seen one of his many appearances on cable news to opine on the financial markets. Or you may remember the week following that fateful day where Mr. Lutnick was miscast as a villain by the media and some of the surviving family members of the 658 employees of Cantor Fitzgerald who died when the first tower collapsed. Howard, thank you for your valuable time today. Can you start by telling us about your childhood? So I had... um... I had a tough beginning, uh, grew up on Long Island, uh, parents were, uh, educators, dad, uh, professor, uh, American history, colonial historian, uh, wor- wrote about, uh, wrote a book about how the British press played out the American revolution. So that's sort of a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool topic. And, uh, when I was applying to colleges, it was very simple. We walked to the library. If they had my dad's book, I could apply. They didn't have my dad's book in the library. No shot at applying. That was it. Card. Now, those days, you know, I'm 62. So card catalogs, right? Um, mom was a, a teacher, uh, art teacher. And, um, and, uh, we were on Long Island. So first thing that happened was, uh, it was a, a heat map of breast cancer on Long Island. And it was in the water. Uh, Matisse Oil, as it turns out, there was a heating oil company that was washing out the trucks, uh, with water and just letting it run into the, into the groundwater. And, uh, and so all the women in that area got breast cancer. So my mother got breast cancer, uh, <clears throat> and they gave her six months to live and she lived five years. So, uh, uh she died in 1978, but she lived like a tornado. So basically, my mother taught me how to live. So when you give her six months to live, she looked at her watch and goes, really, six months? Got to go. And uh, so an example is I, I'd be in class and uh, and the vice principal would come in. You know, the vice principal, of course, is the one who, uh, you know, is uh, hitting you with the ruler kind of thing, right? They're, they're the enforcer comes into the classroom and goes, Howard, Howard, come here. So I get called out. I'm like walking out going, what did I do wrong? And they go, it's your mom. You know, it's your mother. So I go running outside and she's in the car. I'm like, you all right? You all right? And she goes, yeah, yeah, let's go. And we go to the city. So she pulls me out of school. We go to New York City. Uh, we go to art galleries. Then we go to the opera, right? And then we go to a bar and get shit-faced drunk. And I'm 15, 
Okay. And we get shit face drunk. And then we drive home to Long Island, what I call rodeo style, which means windows rolled open. Woo! Woo! Just like rodeo style, right? She's got one hand on the wheel, the other hand out the window. And uh, I guess she wasn't worried about, since she wasn't worried about her, I guess she wasn't worried that much about me. So you know, the whole drunk driving thing. Hey, well, anyway. So <laughs> Was she like that? Was she like that before her diagnosis? Or you're saying after the diagnosis, she kind no, of. No, no. Before she was, uh, you know, a beautiful uh, teaching uh, educator housewife, sort of cooked us great dinners every night. You know, that kind of thing. Just sort of, let's call it traditional Long Island middle class. Okay. And then she gets, uh, she gets, <coughs> she gets, um, you know, terminal cancer. They give her six months to live. They give her chemotherapy, 1978, you know, 77, 76, 75. We're talking, lose her hair, wearing a wig, the whole, the whole deal. So she taught me how to live. I mean, she lived like a tornado. So, uh, I learned that. Uh, this today, this is the gift right here, right now, talking to you guys. This is the point of my life. This is the joy. You don't die. You lose the joy of living. And that's a particular. So you better embrace the world, embrace your joy of life, live every day and enjoy it. So people say, how are you? I said, I'm great. I've always said I'm great. Why? Because the alternative sucks. So this is great, right? So my mother's living like a tornado. Uh, she dies February 1978. So my father had had cancer before that. He had colon cancer. That sort of rages through my family. So you go to the graveyard and all my aunt, uncles and all, all the men in my family have died of colon cancer far back. So if you ask me how often do I get a colonoscopy, I mean, the question is, when am I not getting a colonoscopy is really the question. I got to get a colonoscopy every year. Because I just don't want to die for it. I know what the name of the truck is, and I don't want that one to hit me. Okay, so I get colonoscopy all the time. So uh, my dad had colon cancer, but he got a clean bill of health. Just before I go to college, 1979, summer of 79, uh, my father checks in the hospital. He's got a cough. And um, as it turns out, they tell him uh, he's got uh, terminal cancer. His, his colon cancer has come back as lung cancer, and he's got six months to live. Um, so he goes in, for, drops me off in college, goes to the first chemotherapy shop, uh, local hospital on Long Island, because so we don't have any money. We're not going to, like, fancy New York like that. Nah, nah, nah. You know, local hospital, nurse makes a mistake, gives him someone else a dose and kills him off the spot. Oh, uh, so you lose one parent. It's like one thing. You lose a second parent is a whole nother thing. Okay. It's just a whole nother thing. So at my dad's funeral, at my dad's funeral, my father's brother, he asked me, what am I doing for Thanksgiving? My dad gets killed September 12th, 1979. So first rule, don't hang out with me around that time. It's not really a happy time for me around September 11, September 12. And then they don't, don't really come that way. So, my dad's brother says to me, what are you doing for Thanksgiving? I'm like, Thanksgiving? Isn't that like two months? Isn't that like in November? He's like, yeah, you want to come over for Thanksgiving? I'm like, aren't you worried how we're going to eat tonight? You got me, my brother, my sister? Nope. Never spoke to him again. Didn't speak to my mother's brother or my father's brother ever. They all pulled out because as it turned out, they were afraid we'd be sticky. 18-year-old me, sister's 20, brother's 15. And they were afraid, you know, we'd never leave. You'd think, no, no, no. You bring them in. Like, if I had that chance, I'd bring them right in, live in my house. What are you talking about? That's not the way they thought. So me, my sister, my brother, and we are tight. And I mean tight. And we are together. So... Uh, I drop out of college. I was only there a week. I drop out, make a deal with my sister. I'm going to take care of my brother until you graduate. And then we do the whole swap a route. I go back to college and that's how we do it. So I drop out, tell Haverford College where I went that I'm, I'm not coming back. I'm going to take care of my brother. 
so every night, I try to make my brother dinner. Okay, but you know, what do you think? You think I'm a good cook? <laughs> I don't think so. So what do you think happens? Uh, every night I try to make something and I screw it up. And then mac and cheese out of a box, baby. Mac and cheese out of a box. It, you can't screw up mac and cheese out of the box. Boiled water, throw in the cheese, throw in the macaroni, take the, the little pouch, mix it up. Every single night I try something else, mac and cheese. So <clears throat> it's about three, four months later, maybe, yeah, right towards the end of the year. Um, I go to sleep one night. I have a nightmare. My brother runs track and, uh, and he's really fast. And I have a dream of him running track and he starts sweating and he starts sweating little macaronis start coming out of his body because <laughs> I'm starting to think I'm, I'm killing my brother with mac and cheese. I'm actually killing him with mac and cheese. You know, that's all we eat is mac and cheese. So like a miracle, Haverford College calls me the next day. And they say, listen, we want you to come back. <clears throat> and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work out the money. Don't worry about it. Come back. So I just had this nightmare. So I said, you know what? So I go back to college. I, uh, <clears throat> I give my, uh, I put my brother in a boarding school right nearby. And he lives with me on the weekends. And off I go in my life. So I knew what hell smelled like. I knew what it felt like. Because I'd been there on September 12th, 1979. Me, my sister, and my brother, we were in hell. Real hell. Not, look, nobody has a perfect life, as you both know for sure. But you lose both parents. You're, you're in a particular hell. And, uh, and I knew it. And so you go, you know, we can go after my life, but I was, uh, I'd been to hell before. And so on September 11th, 2001, I just went right back to hell, right back to that place, right back when, to that place. When the college called you and said they'd, they'd work it out later, what is that? I mean, did you, were, was, they were saying financially or the timing or all, kind of all the above? Well, they, you know, look, they, uh, I took as many student loans as they would let me and they paid the rest. So they were awesome. I want to go back to your childhood because I think it's so interesting. Your parents were intellectuals. Your father was a university professor and your mom was a painter and sculptor. What did your dad teach? Did you ever go to museums with your mom? Was your home full of books? So that is a, a perfect score. The question's a perfect score. So my father, being a historian, we go to the store and we buy something for eight dollars and fifty six cents, and he'd say, "Ah, eight fifty six, a great year. That's when Charlemagne." And he'd tell you the whole story about <laughs> about France. Like every year was a story. Uh, my house was full of books, full of books. Uh, every inch of my uh, outside, my backyard, my garage was full of art. And my mother, of course, brilliantly painted. Uh, she, she started painting, and then, of course, she went to sculpture, and she was doing cement sculpture. Okay, cement sculpture, which, of course, weighs a ton. And so whenever she wanted to take photographs of her cement sculpture, she would uh, bribe me and all my friends. So she'd get all my friends. We'd pack it all up on these, uh, uh, you know, we'd get these, like, pickup trucks, and we'd drive to the beach because she wanted to take pictures of her cement sculpture on the beach. And we'd be like, and of course, she only wanted to do it in the winter. She didn't want to do it in the summer. She's like, January, it's the wind is freezing. And we're like wearing these big coats and we're carrying this <laughs> God forsakenly heavy cement sculpture to put up. And my mother, of course, because now you've learned about my mother, she's a little open minded. Bottles of vodka. Here you go, take a swig of this. So we can be like, we got the 15 year old kids carrying the stuff, swigging the vodka and thinking, ah, screw it. We'll drink a little, we'll carry the stuff. And so we set up all these uh, pictures, you know, all these uh, sculptures. But, uh, you know, my, uh, you know, it, but for her illness, you know, we had a, uh, you know, we were, we were happy. My kid, me, my brother, my sister, 
uh, we were close. And then after we lost my parents, you know, <clears throat> we were, couldn't be closer. So for instance, when we lived, when my brother graduated college, um, we lived, uh, we lived within 10 blocks of each other. Were you and your siblings good students? How about sports? Also, did you guys get any artistic abilities from your mom? Uh, no talent whatsoever in the artistic front. Uh, zero, not uh, none. Um, I was, uh, I played tennis and uh, I played D3, okay, which meant I played other people just like me, okay, solid D3 athlete. And, uh, and, um, you know, so I was good enough to play during college and not good enough to play after college. And I knew that. So I wasn't wearing my tennis clothes when we were done with college. Uh, my brother, uh, ran, ran track. He was fast, but again, sort of classic D3 athlete. Um, and we had, you know, we were, what was interesting is when you go to college without parents, you know, who are you showing your grades to? Like, imagine, like, I was a really good student. But, like, you think my sister gave a hoot about my grades? It's like she couldn't have cared less. I'd call her up and say, hey, Edie, I got it. She'd be, like, asleep while I was talking. You know, she didn't care what I got. And my sister was amazing. My sister would get a B on everything. She would get a B if she took one class, two classes, three classes, four classes. So she graduated in three years. She'd take seven classes. She'd get a straight B. Because she knew she was going to get a B and everything. They'd just bring them on in. And I'm like, you're crazy. Who can, who can take seven classes in one semester? She get a straight B. B. So, you know, so she graduated. She graduated college in three years. Of course, she graduated. She got a law school, JD, MBA in like two and a half years. Because she could just, just bring it. Didn't matter. I'm just getting a B anyway. Might as well just bring them all. Just wham them all through. She's like, she's like the smartest person. She can handle more stuff. Like I would just fall over. Like I would have no idea how to do that. I, I still, to this day, I have no idea how she was able to do that, but she is a, uh, she's a special, uh, special uh, lady. So uh, me and my sister, my brother, he, my brother just, he decided he wanted to be me. And I, you know, I graduated, I was uh, three years older than him. So I was out working and, and he just decided he wanted to be me. And, and so he started working harder at school and then ultimately uh, wanted to come work on wall street because he wanted to be like me. And uh, before that, you know, he had bought friends in college, went to Ryder college. He wanted to open a bar, you know, like his freshman year. If you had asked my brother at the end of his freshman year, he's like, my goal is to open my own bar. And I'm like, oh, that's a really great set of objectives for you. It's really going to take you far. But then after that, you know, he wanted to be me and I got, I, graduated college and got a job at Cantor Fitzgerald. I hate to keep going backwards, but I want to ask you about life before Cantor Fitzgerald again. You were only 18 when your father died and you were thrusted into a sort of patriarch role for your family. Can you tell us the story of your benefactor at Haverford College, the retrieval of your brother from California and your feelings of being abandoned by your extended family? So my... My father had uh, just remarried, uh, you know, because it was 18 months. And he, he had just remarried uh, a woman who was uh, also a teacher in, uh, in Cal. She was from California. She had moved to New York. And so uh, she decided to, uh, as soon as my dad died, she moved back to, uh, moved back to California. And, uh, and so she was getting money for taking care of my brother. And, uh, my father had a lawyer uh, who was his friend from uh, like elementary school, and he was the family lawyer. And as it turns out, after my dad died, uh, he just had my all of my parents' money in his checking account. Like he just, you know, he thought there were no one looking, no one around. He would just do what he thought was right. So he had all my family's money in his checking account, and he was just giving my it, my father's new wife and they were married like an hour you know i mean they he was just giving her money because he thought okay she'll take care of my brother so she goes back to california immediately uh starts up with her boyfriend uh her old boyfriend i guess and and that guy's not a good guy so uh he starts hitting my brother and uh 
So that's, that's not going to work. So I fly out, uh, and go get him. And that's, that's when he, I put him in that boarding school. So, uh, I usually don't tell that story, but I go out and go get him. Uh, when I go out to get him, I, I don't have any money. So I, I have a friend and a friend is a friend and, and they let me stay in their trailer. But the trailer is the kind that you put on the back of your car and, and you go like a camper, right? So I slept in there. Okay. No water, no nothing. Just, you know, on, in like sort of on the side where the garbage was. That's where they had, they stored the trailer when they weren't using it. And that's, that's where I lived. And, uh, and then I got my brother and, uh, and we moved back to, uh, you know, back to the East Coast and put him in a boarding school and, and took back over my life. How long did that trip take? Like when you went out there, was it a, like you're out there for a day or was it like a week or longer than that to get your brother? Well, it was, uh, like I left school with like, let's say three weeks left and told him I'd take my tests. So you know, I'd figure it out and the teachers let me go. And so it was like April. And then I took my brother, uh, got a job, found a way to get the money to get him back. We had to buy tickets, we had to buy stuff. So my, my sister got a job as a census taker. What that? She was a census taker going around California being a census taker because you get like X dollars an hour. I and I, uh, I, of course, brilliantly got a job teaching tennis. Yeah, teaching tennis. So I taught tennis for a little while at uh, the Marin County Country Club. And uh, I got an apartment, got enough money, and uh, and then we flew home. So I basically we needed enough money to fly home, and then we uh, and we flew home. And uh, toward the end of the summer, we just flew home, and and uh, I ran out of money. Okay, so I was out of money. So I needed college to open, right? Because I had like five dollars. So what I would do is we'd buy spaghetti in a box because it costs 99 cents. And what I would do is uh, I let that, I convinced Haverford to open their housing for me. They had like these apartments at the end of the campus a week early, but the rest of the place wasn't open. So I couldn't eat on the, in the cafeteria or anything. So I sent my brother around and he'd go borrow salt, you know, and the, and the woman next door who lent us the salt, she goes, she goes, how could you run out of salt? Like salt costs a quarter for like a bucket the size of Quebec, you know, and like, and realize she didn't understand that quarter meant like a lot to me because I, I had five bucks to get me and my brother. Uh, my sister went up to uh, where she was going to school <coughs> and uh, I needed I had five bucks to last a week. And uh, then you should have seen us go to the cafeteria the first day it opened. We had like trays with piles of food like this thing. We were like, it was the best college food ever. <laughs> and what about that, the lawyer? I mean, what ended up happening with the, the money in your guys' and, and well, your family money in his account? Were you able to get so, that back? All right. So I go to college and <clears throat> I'm taking this course the next semester called Ethics and the Professions. Okay. And it's caught, taught by this uh, guy named Frank Fisher. And I remember the guy, a big, tall, lanky guy. And he's teaching this course. And, and then he's talking about ethics of the professions. He's talking about the Hipp Hippocratic Oath and doctors. And then he starts talking about lawyers. And while the guy's talking, it feels like he's talking right at me. Because he's talking about lawyers. And he's talking about lawyers and stuff like that. And I'm like, and I'm thinking about like this guy's check comes from his checking account to me. And like, he, it's like, I'm like, wow. So I need a, I need a lawyer. I figured it out. So I need a lawyer. So I get the yellow pages out. The yellow page, like, you know, that's the way it worked then. No internet. You get the yellow, I look up the yellow pages for lawyers and I find a lawyer who's near the train station and I take the train Penn station and there's a lawyer right above train station. So I go up to see that lawyer and I hire this lawyer. What a trash bin that place was. But we hire a lawyer and, and that day. And then he calls the guy and they say, uh, wait, this guy's name was Bob Frenzy. And, uh, so I said, uh, he called his house. Now, I called with the lawyer sitting next to me and, uh, 
and they say, oh, uh, Bob's not here. He, uh, he's in the hospital. So, oh, oh no, he, he said he had a heart attack. And I said, oh, he had a heart attack. Is, is he all right? What hospital is he in? He goes, no, he died. So Bob Frenzy had a heart attack like a week before. So the problem is my money's, my family's money, by the way, it's not that much money. Let's not, let's not overdo it. Okay. It's not that much money, but it's, you know, it's tens of thousands of dollars, which when you're a kid and you have no money, it's like money. And, uh, I was going to say, when you're, when you got 25 cents for the, for the bag of salt, tens of thousands of dollars would have made a world of difference. Oh man, this was vital. So, and it's in her checking account. So she's like, it's my money. Right. And we have to like fight to get the money. Cause I mean, it's not her fault. His widow saying, what do you mean? It's my checking account. Like, yeah, you know, and so that takes like a year to get the money. Uh, and then, you know, I, I got, I got some money just in time to send my brother on a team tour the next summer. So we sent him on like that the bus tour across the country, you know, and, uh, because I wanted him to start living like, uh, you know, a better life. Because he was, he was on the weekends, he was living in my dorm room. Right. So he'd live in my dorm room with me. And, uh, you know, it was weird. It was a weird life for him. And, and I wanted him to, uh, so we sent him on a team tour. And it was, that was a couple of grand. So I needed the money. <laughs> I needed the money from the frenzies. I needed the money so I could send him on the, on the team tour. And, uh, and so we did it. <clears throat> you know, it sort of settled down after that. You know, I went to college. My sister graduated. She went to law school, business school. She got a JD MBA. My brother went to live with her because when you go to grad school, you get an apartment. So he went and lived with her. And then I graduated. So you graduate with a degree in economics from Haverford, and you end up at Cantor Fitzgerald. There, you quickly establish yourself as Bernie Cantor's protege. How did you do that? You endear yourself to Cantor and his friends by making them huge gains on their personal portfolios. How did someone your age get your hands on their personal portfolios and how did you make them all that money? And if you made them that much money, can you manage my portfolio for me? <laughs> all right. So, uh, so my brother goes to live with my sister. He graduates later from uh, the public high school by uh, Syracuse, right? Syracuse Public High School. He just goes to the high school there. And then he goes to Ryder College, uh, which is in Princeton, not far. So I graduate Haverford College, degree in economics, and I get a job at Cantor Fitzgerald, right? So uh, now I'm a trainee. So I work uh, a couple of months in, in four divisions, and I go around and and then for the final division, I say, I want to, I want to go, uh, to Bernie Canner has this like little group of two people who manage his money. So being a smart guy, I figure, Hey, the name of this firm is Canner Fitzgerald. They're managing Bernie Canner's money. How else am I going to get to know Bernie Canner? So I said, I'll go work for that division. So I, I go work for that division. So these two guys have a desk that points to each other and then they have a desk that points to the wall. And I got the desk that points to the wall. So what I did is I offered to uh, come in early and I do all the analysis. And when Bernie Cantor would call, he'd want an analysis of everything. Like, so I read every newspaper and I would just tell him what happened. Right. I just say what happened today. And then he, he started with one of my favorite lines is that I was done the first day. He goes, well, you read the paper with your eyes. I got to teach you to read the paper with my eyes. Because <laughs> I'm just reading, like, I'm telling him stuff that I think is good. But, like, he was, like, he was probably bored to death with whatever the heck I was telling him. So he had to teach me how to read the paper with his eye. And um, so I got to know him. And then in uh, – so I'm, I'm working in this little division with the three of us. <laughs> and then the boss decides to do something else, and then it's the two of us. And then uh, that guy leaves, so it just becomes me. So I'm – I'm running this little division of me and I have an assistant. And uh, a friend of mine mentioned something to me, and I'm going to tell you how I made him the first $100 million. Okay, so I'm 25, and a friend of mine says, you know, there's this railroad called the Burlington uh, Northern Railroad, and they have this land, uh, and I think the land is, uh, is, is worth a lot. That's what a friend tells me. So I go to the library. 
I look up the microfiche. Okay, you like get this little like stupid. Uh, uh, I don't know, it looks like a negative and you put that in the thing and you twirl it around and it shows a picture of the thing and that's how you read it. I mean, I can't talk to people now. They're like, like, it's like, what could be like, it's an iPad now. You're like, I never mind. Like, I can't believe it. It's so different from an iPad. You can't even imagine how different it is. So, but I get the documents and I read the original documents. And what happened is, in order to make the country industrialized in the 1890s, the government, uh, eminent domain, the land across the United States. And they did it twice and they gave it to the railroads and, and to build a railroad to industrialize the country. And they did it twice. Once brilliantly named the Northern Pacific and the other one was named the Southern Pacific. Okay. So Burlington Northern has a Northern Pacific. So what happened is in 1897, in 1897, they took the land that the government gave them and they borrowed $150 million for 100-year bonds and 150-year bonds. And these bonds controlled this land. So interest rates then were 12%. These bonds were trading about between 60 and 70 cents. So here was my idea. So I analyzed that the land, which was on the books of this company, Burlington Northern, I analyzed in my brilliant 25-year brain without calling a single other person, mind you. So not a single other person that the land is worth four or five billion dollars. And it turns out Burlington Northern is worth like four billion dollars. So I go to Bernie Cannon. I go, OK, here's my idea. We take over Burlington Northern. I found every bond holder. We could buy every bond. It'll cost us like 125 million bucks. We'll buy all the bonds. Then we'll sell the railroad back. And we'll lose a billion dollars and we'll have all this land and we'll make three billion dollars. What do you say? He says, get lost. <laughs> I think he says some 25 year old goes in with this ridiculous concept, taking this, lose a billion, whatever, get lost. So I pound on him because remember, he's got to call me every morning and I tell him what's going on in the world. And then I talk to him and I, I manage all his investments. Manage his investments means he tells me what to buy and sell. And I do what he says. Okay, let's let's not overdo it. Like I'm managing, I'm just doing whatever the hell the guy tells me. Okay, so <laughs> so then <clears throat> it gives me two million dollars to invest. So I buy four million worth of these bonds. Okay, and you, you borrow half. Like you can borrow half. So I borrow half. I buy four million. Borrow half. So he gave me two million cash. I bought four million. I, I spent four million, so there was like let's say six million, worth, six five six million worth of bonds, about six million worth of bonds. But I'm not the only person who knows this, and it's true. So the CEO of Burlington Northern announces that he he's going to retire, but before he retires, he's going to take the land out of this trust because all this this land was in trust for these bonds. And he's going to put in, it was 150 million, remember? He's going to put in 300 million in treasuries just to assure you they're all good. So I, but I remember I read the docs and the thing about me is I'm a reader. Okay. So I read the docs. So I, uh, I go, uh, I call everyone who owns the bonds because I know everybody who owns bonds because I did this nonsense. I was telling Bernie to take it over and I call them all. Remember, there's no video. So they can't see that I'm on some 25 year old kid. <laughs> and I tell them, listen, we're going to file a proxy. We're going to fight the guy. We're going to block it. They can't touch the land. The land can, you know, the bondholders control the land. They can't do this. So I, I hire a lawyer this time. Of course, I'm better. I have general counsel of Ken Fitzgerald who gives me a proper lawyer who has an office and everything. So we send a nasty letter to Burlington Northern. And then I get a phone call from the general counsel of Burlington Northern. And he says, uh, what do you got? I said, well, I, I have four million worth that I bought at, let's say, 65 cents. Remember, these were 3% and 4% bonds, but interest rates were 12%. So the way you get it is when interest rates go up, the value of bonds go down. Remember, when interest rates go up, the value of real estate goes down. Because real estate's like a bond. So it just goes a cent. So he says, I tell you what I'll do. 
I'll give you the $4 million and you keep the bonds. So think about it. I paid $2 million. Now this guy's giving me $4 million. bucks. So I just made four on two. Buying double A bonds, taking no risk at all. Right? And he says, you can keep the bonds. I don't want to switch it. So I call all my guys and they all say yes because they just get free money and they keep the bonds. So they like nothing happened. They don't have to sell anything. They just get their free money and they keep the bonds. And now Burlington Northern's got the land. So I go into Bernie's office and I say, look, you gave me two million to invest. I just turned it into six. Okay. All right. You believe me now? You believe me now? So it's some stupid bond that, that never's moved more than an inch. You believe me? He goes, yeah, yeah, okay, what do we do? So to his credit, he buys a hundred million dollars worth of Burlington Northern stock. Wow. Okay. And then Burlington Northern announces they're going to split the company in two. Burlington Northern and all the land. Burlington Research. Now the land is everything Union Pacific Station. Downtown Philly. Downtown San Francisco. Chicago. And all the land in between with the mineral rights and everything. Right? So they split the company in two. The stock doubles. Bernie Cantor sells at $100 million. DuPont buys the land for $6 billion the next year. Okay? Wow. So I made Bernie... 100 million bucks, and he gave me a bonus of $1 million. <laughs> and I, I, I had my friends say, You made him 100 million, and he only gave you a bonus of one? And I said to my friends, What do you got? <laughs> what do you got? What do you got? Like $6,000 bonus? I just got a million dollars. Like, what is wrong with you? I'm like dancing around happy. And they're like, How can he give you so little? I'm like, What are you doing? You guys are crazy. Because it wasn't my money. Now, two years later, when I came up with another idea, when I walked into his office, eh, he didn't mess around this time. He went, okay, what do you got? What do you got? Let's go. <laughs> and that time he put in uh, 100, 100 million and his friends put in 100 million. And then uh, we, we invested in Pennsylvania and he tripled his money. We what bought it six. What okay, so Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Then there was only state banking, right? You could only bank in the state. So remember, Citibank was New York City Bank, mm -hmm. okay? It was New York City Bank. Like, you could only be in a state. And they were going to make interstate banking. So what Pennsylvania did is they passed a law that said, uh, we're going to let the outsiders come in in one year. And you guys have a year. Get your act together. The inner, before we let the outsiders in because interstate banking was coming. So I figured, okay, let's buy a crappy little bank that's got good locations and someone's definitely going to eat the fish. So we bought this bank. So I go into Bernie Cannon and said, let's go buy First Pennsylvania. It's got great locations. Okay, it's a crappy bank, six bucks a share. So he buys $100 million worth of stock and all his friends buy $100 million worth of stock. <laughs> And then Gerard National Bank buys it for 12 bucks six months later. Wow. And, then, and he's like, should we sell? I'm like, wait, wait, wait. Bank of New York buys it. The, like within a month of interstate banking, Bank of New York buys it for 18. And in, within 15 months, we went from six to 18. So he made 200. His friends made 200. And he gave me a bonus of... Two million dollars. <laughs> and all my friends were saying, come on, man, two million. I'm like, well, now, now I'm, I'm uh, that's uh, 1988. So, so think about it. The first time I beat Bernie, $100 million. And that doesn't count my day job. That's just the story. He really likes me. Okay. After first Pennsylvania, this guy loves me. Okay. <laughs> he loves me. And then, and then in, uh, <coughs> in uh, 1991, so 10 years, I've, I've been there, 83, so I've been there eight years. Um, I, the company's a corporation. I said, we should switch to a partnership. And he says, you can't. 
there's all these rules and, and you just can't for the structure of the company. You can't. So I, I go do the same thing. I go to the library. I study everything. I learn everything. I go, it's, these are, these are terrible rules. They should change. They don't make any sense. They're old. They're from the twenties and thirties. We've got to change them. So I go get an apartment down in Washington. I start going down to Washington all the time and I change the rules. And he, we, in, uh, in September of 1992, we become a partnership. And I got the rules changed in April of 92. And Bernie Cantor saved 50 million a year tax for the rest of his life. So the way I say it is, he liked me when I made him 100 million. He loved me when I made him 200 million. And when I saved him 50 million in tax for the rest of his life, family. <laughs> That's how you got in. That's one way to become a protege. Holy cow. <laughs> You are running the show nine years later. That's a meteoric rise. You surround yourself with friends and everyone is living large. In the summer of 2001, you celebrate your 40th birthday with close friends by going on an extravagant trip to Europe. Can you describe the trip for us and the party that you threw in London? So I'm, I'm now his, uh, his protege. Okay, uh, Bernie Cantor uh, dies in 1996. Uh, he leaves uh, uh, his wife his shares, and he leaves me his votes. So he leaves me control of the company. I then buy out his wife, and uh, and then uh, I roll on. So that's uh, 1996. Um, we make a rule after the 93 bombing. Right, there was a 93 bombing. What came in the 93 bombing is that, uh, you know, we lost our offices, but people didn't die. You know, it was just, it was just an incredibly horrible business stress. And, um, and what happened is the, the executives who were there, who were around me, they all started fighting with each other about themselves. Everybody was trying to use the catastrophe to help themselves. And I realized this, this just was not the way to live life. So when we moved back into the World Trade Center, I dismissed them all, which was crazy, right? You say, wow, really? You moved back in the Trade Center? You've been out a month, and the first thing you do is fire the executive suite? So yeah, they were all jerks. All they cared about was themselves. They didn't care about the company. They didn't care about anything. And then we made a rule at the company. We're only going to hire people that we like. So we all have the same rainbow friends. When the ones on this side, hardworking, smart, capable, think of your friends. Now think of the ones on the other side, make you laugh in a bar harder than anybody else, a little crazy, a little wild. And so let's just go hire these on this side. Okay, that's it. Let's just go hire them. <laughs> and so that was the rule of the company. So everybody hired their friends. So I hired my brother, Gary. Uh, I hired my best friend, Doug. I had my other roommate uh, from college. His, his brother went to Harvard Business School and he ran banking for me. Uh, you know, we hired basically everybody. We hired everybody who was, who was your friend who was capable. And then, uh, and that's the company. And, and we love the company, but it's all little pockets of people who love each other. Not one big happy family, just pocket. And, uh, I turned 40 that summer and I have a big party in London. And I, I have 50 people I work with at the party out of 150. 50 people out of 150 work. And this is my party. So this is not, these are people I love. You know, all these people I love. And uh, it's my 40th birthday. And uh, I win. I win. Like I declare victory. Like I, I have the best life. Uh, I, I'm working with people I love. The firm is killing it. We're making money hand over fist. We're making so much money. I have no debt. Zero. The company, Cana Fitzgerald, no debt. Zero. When you make money, who needs debt? Now I got debt. Yeah, okay. I'm investment grade, but I got debt. I had to rebuild the company. We have to have debt. But then I, we were just happy. And I literally, at my party, I declared victory. What's victory? 40 years of age, beautiful young children, great wife working with great people, really working with your friends, loving everything, couldn't have been happier. It was as good as it could be. Uh, and that was July 14, 
2001, two months before 9-11, two months before. 9-11 was a gut punch for every American. But for you, Howard, it was nothing short of apocalyptic. Can you please describe that morning for us? So I, uh, I took my youngest son, he was three, to his, uh, dropped him off at nursery school. And then I took my next son, my oldest son was five, to his first day at kindergarten. Right? And, he, and uh, his kindergarten's on 90th Street. So I have a picture of me. He's got, he's got a uh, little wet hair. He's wearing a little backpack. And uh, then when you took a photograph, they would put the time on the lower right-hand corner in like an LED little orange thing. Like, I'm so old, all these people listening to this thinking like, what? <laughs> anyway, so, so I have a picture of me with my son in front of the school at 846. Plane hits the building 848. Okay, so I'm, I walk upstairs. I got a flip phone. Phone keeps ringing, no one on the other side. And I'm, I'm mad at the phone. I'm thinking, can't they just leave me alone to take my kid to his first day of school? Why? Why is someone always got to call me? Um, it was my brother trying to get me. Uh, he was in the building. He uh, spoke to my sister. So uh, an administrator comes and says, um, uh, Mr. Lightning, planes hit the building. Uh, and they're looking for you. So I tell my wife who's next to me. She goes, I'll go with you. I go, no, 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 you stay, you stay. I'm going to go downtown. I, I thought it was like some Piper Cub, some moron, flew really close to the building, clipped his wing. It's all like that. You know, something stupid. If you remember, I didn't see it on TV. I didn't hear anything. That's all I got. So I get in the car and uh, got a retired police officer as my driver. And I said, let's just head to Fifth Avenue. Because, I listen, I work down at the Trade Center, so I know I know it cold. And I know the the soonest place you can see the building is on Fifth Avenue. Because you can see it right down, all the way down. And uh, so I go to Fifth Avenue and I I see the belt, the radio's on, and they're saying a big plane at the building, and you can see the smoke coming up. Right, so that's bad. And uh, then we see the building, and it's top of the building's on fire, and it's our building on fire, right? The one, the one with the big antenna. And uh, my driver starts crying. And I'm like, "Look, Jimmy, we got to get there. We just got to get there. We just got to get there." Um, so we're we're driving to the building, and everybody's running away, and we're driving there. So I get. I get out of the car and I run to the door of the building uh, on on this side of the street, on the sort of next to DC Street. And I'm grabbing people. There was a Borders Books for Barnes and Noble, like that bookstore right there. So I'm grabbing people as I come out that door, trying to find someone um, from my from my firm. And we were on 101 to 105. 106 is a catering hall. 107 is windows in the world. I got the greatest office in the world. Okay. Really postcard view from every window, my office or the Statue of Liberty's armpit. You can see her holding it up. Like you can see everything. And I'm grabbing people because I know there's 20 doors. And if they come out of this door, they're coming out of every door. I just need to hear one person come out of my floor and I know they're streaming out everywhere. But the highest floor I get to is 92nd floor. And, uh, and I'm just grabbing people as they come out. And then, uh, like, I have no idea what's going on. You know, I've never seen it. I didn't see a video of it. I just see the flames going. Uh, both buildings are on fire now. Um, I have no idea what's going on. Okay. And then I hear the loudest sound I've ever heard in my life. I'm sitting there in a suit and tie, shoes on. I hear the loudest sound I've ever heard in my life. So, I start running. I, I don't know what I'm running from, but I, I, I just start running. And I think maybe another plane's going to hit the building. I, I have no idea what's going on, but I hear this noise so loud. Um, so I run this way. I run to my right. If I run to my left, I run into the other World Trade Center's collapse. I run that way, I die. I run that way, I die. I run this way. Okay? And I'm running. And I'm running hard. And I'm just running. I don't know what I'm running from. And I look over my shoulder, and there's a tornado chasing me. That big, you've seen that big black cloud just rolling. So that big black cloud is just running after me. 
So I'm running, I'm running. There's a, I'm in New York on a sunny Tuesday and I'm running my ass off from a tornado. And I have no idea what's going on. All of a sudden I was just, you know, jumped into some horror movie. So I dive under a car and I mean dive, like full out dive under a car, hold my head and this black tornado goes whoosh over me. And then it's black. And it's silent. And I'm just holding my breath. Now, I'm not smart enough to pick up my shirt, put it over or something. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm just holding my breath under the car. Then I go, <gasps> and you feel like it's, it's like breathing pea soup. Like it's thick and it's got crap in it and everything. So I know, okay, don't breathe. Hold your breath. Hold your breath. Hold your breath. And I'm like, am I dead? I mean, it's black and silent. So I take my fingers, I go, and I stab myself in the eye. And I'm like, oh, I need. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm not dead. I'm blind. I'm blind. And I'm deaf. Because it's silent. The world is silent. So I'm like, all right, but I'm alive. So I get up, but I'm hiding under a car. Smash the living heck out of my head. Unbelievable. Smash it. And I feel I'm like bleeding down my face now. Okay. So I'm like, oh, I'm under a car. So I climb out and I get up and it's black. So I start to run in the black. So you know what happens next, right? Run into a parked car. I just run out. Like, Boom. I go flying over some parked car. So now I'm bleeding down my face. I'm, I'm covered in soot and black and I'm limping. Like I'm just brutalized. And I just I just walk up town. And I just walk up town. And I walk till people are clean. There's color and people are clean. So there's a payphone and there's a line uh, at the payphone. So I walk up to the front of the line. Some woman's talking on the phone. I take the phone from her. And I hang up. She turns around, starts cursing at me. Then she looks at me. She sees a ghost because I'm bleeding and I'm covered in soot and stuff. She just walks away. And I call my wife, tell her I'm alive. It's like an hour and a half later, two hours later. And I heard that sound from my wife because she knew I was going in that building. Because remember, these are all my friends. These are all my friends. And I'm going in that building. And uh, she knew I was going. And uh, then I'm alive. And she tells me, I'll tell you one more story about this. She tells me, uh, my general counsel, my lawyer, my favorite partner, is uh, is alive. And, and he's he's home. So he lives in the village, Greenwich Village. Wow. So I walk up there. So I walked to his apartment. Let's say it takes 45 minutes to walk to his apartment. <clears throat> I ring his bell. He opens the door. He's covered in blood. Head to toe. He's in his apartment hours after the attack. And he's covered in blood. And he's so in shock. He's not like washing his face. Like he's, he's out of it. So I'm like, you're right. You're right. I grab him. I go, you're right. He goes, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. I go, whose blood is it? He goes, I, I don't know. He was in the elevator of the World Trade Center. So they have these elevators. They go up to 78 real big and fast, and then you switch floors to the next set. He was in that elevator when the plane hit. So elevators don't crash. They rappel down mechanically. They have, like, brakes come on, and they just slowly go down, and then the door is jack open, and he went running out of the elevator. So think about this. The plane hits the building. The gas from the plane goes down the elevator shafts. So it finds the elevator shaft that goes to windows in the world. It goes, the gas goes all the way down to the lobby and explodes. Boom! Fireball in the lobby. Burns a couple of my employees, kills one of my employees, burns another uh, one of my beautiful employees, 70% of her body. And uh, the fireball, so he's running out of the elevator. Fireball goes by. Huge amounts of broken glass. 
he steps out covered with blood. He stepped between the broken glass and the blood. He got splattered with the blood. Has no idea who's it is. And he's in his apartment, standing there, not washing his face, not changing his clothes, because he's just in shock. And then, and then I see what happened on the television. And then I leave his apartment. I stand in the middle of the road, flag down a car that's going up town. You know, remember, I'm, I'm, you know, now I've washed my eyes, but otherwise I look like I was flushed down a, a chimney and uh, stopped the bleeding, but my, I'm covered in you know, whatever. I go, I ask the guy to drive me uptown. Can I drive me uptown? I go see my best friend, Doug's widow, Jennifer. Because I knew he was in the building and I know he's dead. Because I died, I almost died and I was outside. So I know there's no play or chance that these guys are alive. And uh, I go see her and I, I want her to see me like, you know, covered so she could understand. And I hug her and uh, tell her he's gone. And I, and I hug Jennifer and then, uh, and then I walk home. And walk home and I see my wife. You, you said your brother tried to call and then, but he got a hold of your sister. What, what was his message? I mean, he was in the building, right? Yeah, so he, he gets my sister on the phone. She's like, Oh, thank God, Gary, you're not, you're not there. He goes, Oh, I, I am there. And uh, I'm calling to say goodbye. And, uh, there's no way out and I'm going to die. And I just want to say goodbye. I tried to call Howard. I can't get through. Just tell him I love him. I love you. I'm sorry. And that's an amazing story. Tragic, but amazing. Your secretary, known for her punctuality, missed her train that morning by seconds. Another executive apparently had a visitor that forgot his ID and had to be escorted out. His secretary was pregnant, so he went himself, and the first plane hit just as he reached the lobby. He was doubly blessed when the jet fuel resulted in a huge fireball that engulfed and incinerated people in a different part of the lobby. Did you ever talk to either one of these people about your shared good fortune, if you'd call it that? How do you cope with something this tragic? So people would say to me, you know, aren't you so lucky? And um, your luck and that kind of stuff. And I'd say, yeah, but let's say I took a gun out, pointed it at your head, pulled the trigger, the bullet went between your head and your ear and it killed your brother and it killed all your friends. Still feeling so lucky? I don't feel that lucky. I feel, um, I mean, of course, I get to kiss my, my wife. I get to spend my life with my spectacular children. Um, so in that respect, of course I'm lucky, but the concept of the bullet missing my head and hitting my brother and all my friends. Yeah. I don't, I don't think of it as lucky. I think of it as it's a shrug, you know, it was a shrug. I wasn't there. <clears throat> there was no greater reason that I was there. I don't buy that. I don't buy that. God wanted to save me but he wanted to kill all my friends and my brother. I, I, I don't buy it. I just, I just wasn't there. Look, I wasn't there that morning because my son had his first day of school. And, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of horse, man. Started school that day. September 11th, first day of school. Way to go. But, uh, you know, yeah, you know, my friend Dave, a guy who, who went down because his 
you know, his wife is pregnant. These are all, that was my best friend from high school. Best friend from high school. And uh, he was in the lobby. And my secretary, uh, Marianne, <coughs> you know, she had a boyfriend. He worked at the firm. You know, she lost her boyfriend. She lost all her friends. You know, it was just, just was, like you said, apocalyptic. It was just 658 out of 960 in New York. 658. Do you ever have dreams about what happened that day? I had, I had nightmares for a long time. I'd say the first day I didn't cry. October 21st, 2004. Was the first day I didn't cry. And how do I know that date? Because as I got into bed with my wife and went to sleep, I said, you know, I didn't cry today. And we took a note of it. Um, yeah, I had, I had every kind of nightmare. I liked the movies. Okay, I'd, I'd get up in the middle of the night, I'd grab my wife, I'd pull her out of bed, yank her out of bed, drag her across the floor, hide in the closet. And then she'd look at me and realize her husband was asleep. <laughs> She's thinking, oh, boy, oh, boy. <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, I look, I, uh, the dream I often had was um, I'm sitting in my office looking uptown. I see the plane coming. I know the plane's going to hit. I have enough time to get out. I have enough time to get out. So I try to grab people and say, come on, come with me, come with me, come with me, come on, let's go, let's go, we gotta leave, we gotta leave. And they're like, what, 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 what's going on, what's going on? I never make it to the other. And I always wake up in a ball of sweat when the plane hits. But I, I don't have those dreams anymore. Those dreams ended in October 2004. When I stopped crying, then, uh, then I stopped the tourniquet of my, you know, I had tourniquet in my business, which means I stopped the bleeding, stopped losing money. All I cared about was giving money to the families, you know, and then I decided I wanted my business back and I was going to grow the company. And so when I stopped crying, that was the beginning of me trying to grow the company. Did something happen that led to you, like you not crying? Did you get good news? Or you think it was just enough time for you to process it all mentally? I don't think you can process that much. And what happened is every day something would remind me of someone who hadn't yet processed. You know, so like, uh, you know, they just say, you know, I'm sorry about Saria. You know, and Saria was my, uh, my PR or my investor relations person. You know, but I hadn't thought about Saria. So then I, I'd see her beautiful face and she'd be killed right then and there. And I'd start crying. Cause I hadn't thought about it yet. Yeah. You know, you just can't, you just can't process them all. You can't think about it. Like I went to, I went to my friend Joe Shea's funeral. Okay. Now Joe Shea ran North America. And he, what a rock star that guy was. Tall, handsome, amazing, great, greatest guy. He ran my North American business. So I go to his funeral, St. James church, the Upper East Side, beautiful church, Crowd jam, crowd is like hundreds of people outside. They can't all fit in the church. It's unbelievable. So I, I go in and I became a, a funeral and church expert. Okay, I know the Eucharist by heart. Like I, I was an expert. And um, so I go in the front. I'd say hello to his wife Nancy, and I sit in the second row. And I sit down, and the person next to me hands me the mask card. So I look at the mask card. And there's a beautiful picture of my friend Joe Shea. Right next to it is a picture of his brother Danny. See, and I hadn't processed Danny dying yet. I, I was going to my friend's funeral. I get it. It's sad, but I got it. I, I get it. Everybody's friends died. They get it. You go to the funeral. I get it. But I had not realized his brother Danny had died. And he got killed right then and there. So I start crying. I can't stop crying. So I get up, I leave the church, I go outside and I sit on the stairs of the church and I'm crying and I am crying and it's coming out of me like, like a, like a, like a hose. And I'm sitting there crying. And then 
a, a black truck pulls up in front of the church and uh, some woman gets out and works at like some PR company that we had hired like, I don't know, like two years before to do the earnings of my company, whatever they go, you know, you have a public company, just do the earnings out there. And she says, and we booked John Larry King, you know, to tell everybody that you're in business and you're going to try to help the families. <laughs> so I get in the car, right? I am literally a wreck. There's nothing inside of me that's reasonable, nothing that's together. I'm just a smashed human being as can be. And then I go on Larry King. And you want to see a smashed human being, go look up my interview with Larry King. You know, he starts talking about my brother and all my friends, and I start crying, and I'm just a I'm just a pile of just, just nothing. It's nothing to me. And I'm just crying and sad and Larry King then used that interview, like, you know, on his lead in, you know, live with Larry King. And they're like, he'd show all these great interviews of all these world leaders. And he always had a picture of me, like, as a mess crying. And I'm like, great, great. Everywhere. Every time I saw Larry King, I was like, this great lead in interview with me crying. In the aftermath of 9 11, things got very strange for you with the media. You told the families of the Cantor Fitzgerald victims that you couldn't afford to keep paying the victims' salaries because the company would go out of business. But you did agree to help them. That story is often misconstrued. Can you tell us what you did do? Then, about five years later, when the company was back on its feet, you donated $180 million to a fund for those families. Can you describe the feelings over the mischaracterization by the media? So, I announced that we're going to take care of the families of the people who died. Okay. Uh, and then we're going to give them 25% of our profits. And we're going to pay for their health care for 10 years. Pretty noble. Pretty extraordinary. The media Twenty-five percent of nothing is nothing. Can't have a guy like me cry. It's got to be fake. Literally, guy comes out on TV and says he's crying crocodile tears. Really, the mass murder of my brother and all my friends is insufficient for a CEO to cry because the media hates them so much. They're not human beings. So I'm crying crocodile tears. 25% of nothing is nothing. Uh, you know, it's fake. Uh, Barbara Walters. Barbara Walters. You know, when the when the cameras were on, he cried. But when the cameras went off, it's another story. Right? Just beating the heck out of me all day on TV and in the media because no reason. I, I the the other firms in the trade center who lost a few people, they decided they were going to pay the salaries of people who died. A weird thing to do, to pay a dead person's their income, their salary through the end of the year, and then that was it. But everybody died working for me. People who made $2 million a year because they brought in 4 or $5 million in business. I, I can't pay them $2 million when they're dead. It's just like, with what money? Like the company was losing a million a day. It was destroyed. I mean, everybody who didn't die expects to get paid. There's no revenue, no business. We're not like the next day, we're not saying, oh boy, let's go out and make some money. You know, this place is, it's just bleeding out of every pore of our body. And uh, I'm just trying to figure out how to survive. And the media just treats me like a pinata. You know, the first thing is, when I announced that we're going to give them 25% of our profits and pay their health care for 10 years, the media sort of builds me up. And then you know how that works. The media builds you up and then they, they cut you out. So all of a sudden, I'm like Mr. Evil. I'm a villain. Like what, what in the world did I do? Nothing. I offered to rebuild the company to take care of these families. And then the media is just beating the pants off every day, every single day. You know. Bill O'Reilly every day, every day, 
Fahey doesn't come on this show, and I'm getting death threats. You know, it's, it's unbelievable. The next plane should fly into your house. And then so we get to like the middle of October, and I figure out how big does the company need to be to survive. And then, you know, companies on Wall Street, they have capital to do their business. So I figure out what we need to survive. And I send in families $90 million. Just whatever money we have. Just send it out. And uh, the media just stops. They don't know what to do with someone who does what they say they're going to do. They just leave me alone. They just stop. And then I tell people what I'm really doing, which is every employee who joins us agrees to give 25%, not of our profits, because there aren't going to be any profits. Come on, let's face it. What profits are there going to be in this company? We give 25% of our payroll. Every employee who joins us agrees that if they were going to make 200 grand, they're going to make 150 grand, and we're going to give 50 grand to the families. So I start sending the families money all the time, right away, because they need the money now. They don't want the money in some other day. And now the media doesn't know what to do. The Financial Times, you know, it's like an orange, pink newspaper, a big newspaper. They named me the man of the year in 2001. And, uh, and then the New York Times Sunday business section on like January 2nd or January 3rd, the first Sunday in the new year, writes a couple of thousand word story, apologize, puts the top of my bald head on the top of the page and my toesies on the bottom, some picture, and just puts me on the full thing. We open it like this. And they apologized for being jerks during that period of time when they were writing nasty stuff about me. And what did I do? I did what I said I was going to do. But our employees, I mean, think of, think of these employees, right? They, they join and they give 25% of their money. It's like you joining and you agree to give 20. Like, what did you do for this? But, and if people didn't do it, okay. So in 2008, like, the problem is, how do I go forward with my life? I've got these hundreds of people who've given $180 million to these families. But they gave it themselves out of their pockets. And they, they're not, they're just amazing human beings. So how can I go forward and make money and build something? Can't do it. So what I do is uh, we, we take one of our divisions strong enough now. In April of 08, we decide to take a division public. Uh, and we take the company public, but it's a weird offering. What we do is I, I give my shares to all my employees and they sell. So let's say you, you join me and I was going to pay 200,000, but I only pay 150. So you give 50 grand, then you give 60 grand because you got to raise, then you give 70, 80, 90. You give 300,000 bucks over those five years, right? I gave you 600,000 worth of stock. You sold 300 in the IPO. So you got to check for 300 grand. So we're square. And you got another 300,000 in stock because God bless you. You saved my life. You stitched my insides together when I needed it, when I needed it. Okay. So think about that for a second. Okay. What's the turnover at this company? Lowest. Who's got the greatest employees? I do. What percentage of the company do they still own? 30%. So it's the model of this place. The employees own the company. Who works for who? I work for them. They work for me. They have 30% and I have 20%. Why, why is that? So once upon a time, my employees saved my life. And I love them. Are a lot of those people still there? Are a lot of those uh, employees that came, you know, to your aid and the 25%? 
well, it's a lot of years. That's true. So yeah, it's been the answer is lots, but it's a lot of years. You yeah. know, it's 20 odd years and uh, there's a lot of people still here. But, and I employ the kids of people who got killed. So I had a job offer, uh, any kid, any kid of someone who got killed working for us, we'll, we'll give them a job. We'll train them, teach them, and never. So I got a square, I had to be square with the widow or the widower, right? I mean, who wants their kid to go work with their husband or their wife got killed? You know, so you got to prove to them how much you love them and never underestimate the opinion of a 22 year old. <laughs> a 22 year old. So I've had like 130, 140 kids come work for me. So think of that, what that means, how well I did with their families. They know I love them. They know I love them. Now, I have about 32 here now, today. And someone just told me a story how uh, I was just in in Washington at a dinner. and Some guy at my table comes up and says he married uh, a widow, one of my guys. And his kid was, and the kid was troubled. And never could you know, focused in school. It wasn't good in school and dropped out of college and couldn't hold a job. And they said, you know, we remembered that you promised to offer everybody a job. So Howard, you don't remember this, but I called you. And my wife called you five years ago and you said, okay, great. So you hired him and, uh, and you found the right job for him. And he came home and he said, uh, I finally feel at home. Yes, you saved my son's life. His son worked for me for three years, and then he joined the Green Beret. You know, so, you know, that was like a story. That was a story told to me in 2024, like a month ago, by some guy named Tony. I still don't remember his last name. <laughs> Um, yeah, the, the ripple effect must be amazing. All those families, all the kids, all the yeah, all of it. If we go out to dinner in New York, someone is going to come up to us and say the nicest things you've ever heard. Because all these people have family, they got friends. You know, it's a lot of people. And uh, I got a lot of friends up there. The way you show someone you love them, show love to people they love. I don't usually tell the story very often because it's, <laughs> yeah. no, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, the story is, the story is, uh, my dad always would say to me, the truth is stranger than fiction. I mean, that story is just unbelievable. Howard, you and your wife, Allison's generosity knows no boundaries. You're a major patron of Haverford College and the Guggenheim Museum, just to name a few. And I know personally that your philanthropy extends far and wide because several years ago, you made an unsolicited donation to Tackle ALS, a website that my family and I set up to funnel donations directly into Massachusetts General Hospital's extensive ALS research efforts. Thank you for that. God knows how many other things that you support. But what's your latest charitable focus? Well, thank you for telling me. I did not, <clears throat> I didn't know when I agreed to do this that I had any history with you guys at all. I just thought what you were doing was amazing, trying to raise money for ALS. And I thought it was beautiful. So I just agreed to do it for that reason. And now I'm proud of myself for having been there earlier. That's good. <laughs> that was good. But, uh, that. <laughs> so every year on 9-11 or the business day closest to it, it's on a weekend, we host a charity day. All my employees waive their day's pay. We ask our clients to do as much business as they possibly can. And, uh, and all that money we give away to charity. We give it to like 150 different institutions. And what we do is we ask the charity to send a celebrity spokesman. And the reason we do that is because um, 
I don't want my employees working their tail off all day and going home negative. You know, I worked all day. I worked really hard. And uh, the firm gives it all away. Instead, what they do is they go home and they see their kid and they said, you know, I worked for charity all day. And look, here's a picture of me with Peyton and Eli Mann. And they go, wow, dad, you have like the coolest job ever. I'm like, exactly. Right. So that we have Gronk, he, he, you know, he slams the phone on the ground and we had Lady Gaga comes and sings poker face and we have everybody come. We have, we had, when Hillary was running against Donald Trump, we had, a, we had Donald Trump in the morning and Hillary in the afternoon. Okay. So we, we, we have everybody because, you know, it's a beautiful thing to do and we give away about 12 million bucks a year. Uh, someone once asked me, why do you give away 12 million? I said, because, uh, whatever we raise, I top it off. <laughs> so I don't want, I don't want to say oh, we did a little more, a little less more than a year and next. So I just top it off. But, <clears throat> uh, then we give, we do small things all year long and then we do some big things. So we do our, we do uh, disaster relief. We went to, you know, when Hurricane Sandy was in New York, we adopted 19 elementary schools. We go to Houston when Hurricane Harvey went to Puerto Rico with Hurricane Maria, went to Moore, Oklahoma when they had the tornado. Uh, and the next move for us is we're going to do a, uh, a disaster relief in Israel and we're going to take care of, uh, hostage families, civilian families and, uh, and IDF families, people with young children and, uh, just give them money. We don't, uh, we're, we're not their mother. Okay. We just give them money and, and we tell them to do the right thing for their family. So I, I, I tell the story that, um, so right after 9 11, we were going to have a memorial in October, early October. Um, and so I called this young woman named uh, Julie Human. Her, her husband was Jonathan Human, a total great guy. And I asked her to speak at the memorial. And we were having a memorial in October. Uh, and there were about 5,000 people came because you have 658 people and they got husbands and wives and children and friends and cousins. And, and she said, Howard, I can't because I'm going to Disney. And I got to tell you, it blew me away. I'm thinking, Disney? Disney? And it just caught me so off guard. I, and she said, Howard, I've been crying every day for a month. I can't, I can't let my young kids, I can't let my young kids think that the world is, I can't let my young kids think that this world is a sad place. So I'm going to suck it up and I'm going to take them to Disney and get them to smile. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, my God, this is the strongest person. Really, this could be the strongest person in the world. And what I learned that time is if you look at women with young children who've gone through a disaster like this, and you look really closely at their feet, they're not walking on the ground. They're walking this far over the ground. Because these are the most extraordinary, most powerful human beings. Because they'll do anything to protect their family. And she went to Disney when she was the saddest person on earth. So our disaster relief is very clear. I want to put money in the hands of young women. Let them take care of their family. And if that's not politically correct, I don't give a damn. These, these people are the most extra, extraordinary people on earth. And I've seen it. And there's nothing more powerful. That's amazing. Can we get your views about the conflict in Israel going on right now? <laughs> well, see, people misunderstand. They say... Islamophobia. There's no one who's afraid of someone who worships Islam. There's only one thing people are afraid of. Jihadophobia. It's 
Someone who wants to kill everybody who's not in their religion. Yeah, that's worth. So I understand jihad. Jihad killed my brother. Jihad killed my friends. Islam did not kill my friends. Muslim did not kill my friends. Jihad killed my friend. Jihad wants to kill the West. They want to kill every Jew, and then they will kill every Christian, and they will kill every Hindu. And if you don't understand, go watch the movie Hotel Mumbai. Twelve jihadists from Pakistan with bags full of ammunition and some machine guns go into India to kill the infidel, one billion, two hundred million Hindus. Kill the infidel. So I think people who talk about free Palestine, this is a setup paid for by anarchists or people who are have a wild thing that want to destroy America. Because jihadists are the scourge of the West. And so you saw jihadists. They think they're making points with God to behead a baby, to rape and kill women, and to butcher people. This is not the same as our planet. This has nothing to do with our planet. This has to do with a religious fundamentalist who's gone way over the deep end. And you either wipe them out or you will suffer the consequence. I suffer the consequence. Make no mistake about it. My firm was killed by jihadists. And they were happy to kill every American. And they were happy to kill more Americans. And when the world finally realizes that the West, all of it, the one thing they should destroy is anyone who believes in jihad has nothing to do with Islam. It has to do with crazy people who believe in jihad. And that's the difference. And Hamas believes in jihad, and they need to be destroyed. Because if you don't destroy them, it's very simple. They will come kill you. And that's the way it's going. You are also a major fundraiser for former President Donald Trump. Does he share your views on Israel? He does. He does. Howard, I would like to give you the opportunity to talk about the most important people to you, your wife, Allison, and your four precious children. So I was lucky. I've been married just under 30 years to the greatest girl. My wife, Allison, is just she's my uh, she's my great friend, uh, my lover, my partner, uh, everything. I have the greatest marriage. Um, she waits up for me. She waits for me to have dinner. She just, she's just the best girl. You know, I'm lucky I have the best girl. And I tell her every day that I walk in the house and I'll yell, hello, greatest girl. So, uh, cause I think she is, uh, we have four kids. Uh, oldest boy lives in London. His name is Kyle. He saved my life that morning. Uh, just a beautiful person living in London, working in our real estate business, doing, doing really a fantastic job. He flew in for 24 hours for Mother's Day. Sunday night came in Saturday, flew back Sunday night because he had to be back at work on Monday. And that's a uh, pretty good. My other, my second son, he was at a wedding in Italy and he flew back and got in for Sunday night dinner. So the two of them didn't see each other. One of them left at about two o'clock and had to fly back, and the other one got in at about four o'clock. But she saw all of her kids on Mother's Day, and they flew back. So Brandon, my second son, uh, he works with me. He sat, he listened to part of the interview over there, uh, and he, he works with me in New York. And uh, it's my greatest pleasure. It's greatest pleasure. Went to went to the two of them went to Stanford. Uh, you know, I, I said my wife helped them color inside the lines better than anybody else. Okay. The great at coloring inside the lines. Then, uh, my daughter, of course, smarter than their two brothers, as you would expect. The girls are always smart. So she's taking her MCATs next month. It's going to be a doctor. And, 
you know, I can't be more proud of uh, her. She she shadows a brain surgeon who cuts open people's brains. And it's just just stories. I mean, some people should do it. Some people should. Okay, <laughs> and uh, she's uh, she's, she's going to help humanity, which I uh, which I admire and I love. And and she's such a smart, thoughtful, beautiful girl. She's going into great on for the earth. And then my youngest son, uh, shooting guard on the basketball team, just finished the, you know, leading scorer, great shooter, scores like 20, big homecoming game. We, we got like 40 people because I'm talking about my son, what a great shooter he is. So all my friends came and they said, really? All right, let's see your boy play. Let's see what he's got. You're always talking about it. Let's see what he's got. So I said to him before the game, I go, you better bring it, pal. I got like, I got a crowd. All my all his siblings bought a car. We had forty people. It was like six hundred people. Tom Brady's sons on the other team playing on the other team. My son puts up twenty eight, five for eight from three points. Never misses, you know, foul shots. He's just he played such a beautiful game, and they're all like, "Wow, he's a baller." I'm like, yeah, you know, so, and he's uh, <laughs> he's going to Duke, and uh, I, I really I, I I have the best kids. And the best kids, my uh, and my sister lives around the block from me, and uh, you know she lives close to me, no matter where she is. And uh, you know, one of my favorite people on the earth. So we are, me and my sister remain as tight as could possibly be. I got the best wife. I have the best kids. You know, I have. Uh, I love my firm. I love the firm. It's a special place. Uh, company's got thirteen thousand employees now. 13,000. We had 2,000 on 9 11. Lost 658, went down to under 1,000. Had 150 in New York. On January 2nd, 2002, we had 150 in New York. Now we have about 5,000 in New York. So I love my firm. I love working here. I love the place where we're going. We disappeared for 20 years. It took us 20 years to build the place back. And now it's who it should have always been. Should have been there 20 years ago, but it's there now. And this is an amazing company. It's got Newmark, a great commercial real estate firm, fantastic commercial real estate company. BGC, Bernie Cantor's initials. I go like this because this portrait hangs over my desk right over there. And uh, named it for his initials. In 2005, he died in 1996. Why don't you name it HWL? Because I love that guy. I love that guy. And uh, I just, I've been through a lot. I've been through a lot, but I got great people around me. I love them and they love me. And uh, and this is the joy of life. Love it. Live it every day. Because this is it. This is a gift right here, right now. Flashing back to 22 years ago at your at your 40th birthday, do you feel like you've you're back on top of the mountain and you've achieved victory again where you're at today? I think I have all the tools uh, to play the hand for the company now. I think <coughs> the way I think about it is uh, my three companies are like my children; they have a destiny. And it's my job to help them get to their destiny. It's, it, mm. it's their destiny. And, uh, and I think they can go get there. They have great management. They have great leadership. Um, I love the people I work with. Um, I, I think it's different. I think it's different. different you know, different if you'd ask me, life. yeah, you know, then, <laughs> then was then and this is now. You know, I've been through a lot. Um, I had cancer. I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, and I dealt with it, I think, differently than most. Uh, the morning I was going in for chemotherapy, I took my phone, I put it on a stand, and I made a video, sent it to all my employees to tell them what I was going through and what I was doing. And, uh, and I kept them posted all the way through because I wanted them to hear it from me and see it from me. And, uh, you know, I had a treatable, curable cancer. And it was treatable and curable. And here I am. Look, my same 12 hairs in the middle. They all grew back. Thank goodness, you know. 
It's very important to me. These 12 hands are really important. When I lost them, people were like, oh, you look good bald. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> now I got hair in my face so that I, at least I got hair somewhere. But um, I love my life. I love my life. Howard, let me ask you another thing too. We One of the things that was important about the podcast is we didn't want to make it about ALS. We want to make it about just people with great stories like like yourself. We didn't want to make it my dad's football background or an author. We, don't make, we want to make it like very appealing to everybody and, and hearing all different kinds of perspectives and stories. So I ask us at the end of every episode, um, who is somebody that you know that you think we should try to get on here and share their story? Um, someone who has, you know, overcome anything or, or just an interesting story, even if it's not adversity. So, you know, usually I'm a fast thinker. And uh, not the thing about that. Sorry, can't give you a fast answer. No, no problem. I'll, th- I'll think about it. You can get back to us with recommendations another time. Howard Lutnick, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for your incredibly valuable time. May God continue to bless you and your family. Thank you guys for spending the day with me. Tim, thank you for all you do. Uh, Troy, thanks. And uh, I wish you great success in your quest to, uh, to crush ALS. Way to go, guys. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to BarkleyDamon.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Nurse Corps, the heart of healthcare. This is the home healthcare company that I personally use. I also wanted to give a special thanks to all my amazing nurses. For more information, go to nursecore.com. I want to thank my partners at Barkley Damon for supporting this podcast, Nursecore for their truly amazing team, and of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to tackleals.com. For cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you want to make a contribution, go to tackleals.com.